Hi, my name is Carlos Cardoza Orlandi, and I am professor of World Christianities and Mission Studies here at Perkins School of Theology, Southern Methodist University. I am also the director of the Doctor of Ministry program uh, at here at Perkins. Um, I am originally from Puerto Rico, um, and I am extremely passionate about the questions and inquiries about Christian mission and the movement of the Christian religion when it crosses cross-cultural, linguistic, um, class, economic boundaries. And um, what I am going to present to you um, today in this video is the following topic. From Mission Fields to World Christianity, a Protestant overview of Christianity's shift to the global south. You probably have read or have heard that the vitality of the Christian religion is actually found in what we called the global south. And by the global south, we actually mean the regions of sub-Saharan Africa and also North Africa, um, Latin America, including Mexico, and also Asia. Um, the Global South is the region that used to be understood as the mission lands. Um, whereas the Western world, particularly the USA and Western Europe, used to be understood as the Christian lands or the sending lands. So what we're going to do today is actually look at um, three basic questions. The first question is, how do most Protestant Western Christians understand the religious condition of the global South regions? That's the first question. The second question is going to be, how did Christianity gained ground in the Global South. Because as I said earlier, today most of the Christian population um, and the vitality of the Christian faith is actually found in the Global South. So what, what happened that we had this shift going on? And the third question is going to be, how would we describe the current character of the vitality of the Christian religion in the Global South and what makes it keep this vitality. So with those three questions in mind, let's address the first one. How do most Protestant Western Christians understand the religious condition of the Global South regions? And in order to answer this question, we first need to look at history. And uh, what you're going to be watching in a few seconds is a map. And this is a map that goes back to the mid, um, late 18th century. It's actually the first Protestant missionary map um, created in Britain in order to explain the religious condition of the world. As you can see in the map, in the light blue area, you will find that the light blue area represents what the legend of the map calls um, the Protestant lands. If you continue to look at the map, you will find that there are red regions in the map and also pink regions in the map. Both of those regions represent other expressions of Christianity. In the red, you actually find Roman Catholicism. And in the pink, you actually find the Orthodox churches, both Russian and Greek 
and other expressions of the Orthodox churches. Now, according to the legend of the map, these areas are considered to be deficient Christianities. The other significant color in the map is actually the brown. And if you look at the map, you will see that the map shows all of this brown area in North Africa and what today we call the Middle East. All of that area was considered a region that had mistaken religion or a, re a false religion. And as you, as you probably know, in these regions today are predominantly Islamic regions. So what happened was that in the Protestant imagination of the um, late 18th century and 19th century, Basically, Islam was considered a heresy of Christianity. Not necessarily another religion, but a heresy. And therefore, it was considered a region that was, um, had a false religion. Finally, the whole map, most of the entire map, actually shows um, in black the, what at that period was called the heathen lands. So we basically have three categories in this map that begin to um, give us an insight into the way in which Western Protestant missionary world understood the rest of the world. There was number, actually four. There was one, Protestant Christianity. Secondly, there was deficient Christianities. And by deficient Christianities here, it was Roman Catholics and Orthodox, and then we also have the, re the region of false religion, which is the, re the region of Islam, and then we had the rest of the world, which included where Hinduism is present, where Buddhism is present, folk religion, all of those regions in Asia, some of them in Latin America, or some of them in Africa, all of those regions were considered the land of the heathens. So, in the Protestant missionary imagination, basically, Christian mission was about three activities. To the deficient Christians, it was a way of upgrading the deficient Christians. And Protestantism actually did that job. For the false religion areas, in this case, Islam, the basic purpose was to correct that religion to correct the heresy. And for the heathens, which were mostly in Africa and in Asia and in parts of Latin America and actually the United States as well, as you can see in the map, the main purpose is to save or to convert the heathen towards Christianity. So when I speak to my students from the United States, many of my students from the United States, or even students from the global south who have this understanding of what Western Christianity thought about themselves, <laughs> what we discover is that in the religious imagination, you basically have that the areas of the global south, Latin America, Africa, and Asia, is basically a land that needed Christianity. And therefore, Christian missionary, the Protestant Christian missionary movement, went to those regions in order to either upgrade the Christianity that was already there, correct false religions that were there, or save or convert those who were heathens. Now, what is the problem? The problem with that understanding is that we can say that the Christian missionary movement was successful because Christianity is growing in Latin America and Christianity is growing in Africa and is growing in Asia. So in a way we can speak about the success, the success of the Protestant missionary movement. But there's a difference, you see? When Protestant missionaries began to work in the Global South, 
the expectation was to create a photocopy of the west of western christianity so it was the photocopy of christianity of the west taken expanded in the global south but the problem the problem was that that did not happen actually there were there are no photocopies of western protestant christianity in the mission field so, this takes us to the second question that we have. How did Christianity gain ground in the Global South? This is in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia. In other words, why did it grow so fast, and why does it have so much vitality? Now, when we look at, a, at the second map, as you are looking at the map, you will see that I have, in this map, you have red regions. And those red regions show where Christianity has most of its population and its vitality. Also, if you look at this map purposely, you see that the red is going into the blue which is the areas where actually Christianity is either not growing or declining. And I included those, those border places where you see the red inserting into the blue and changing the color, because what I want to communicate is the fact that the global South Christians are moving to, to the Western context of the old Protestant Christianity, and they are changing that character of Christianity. But before we talk a little bit about that, let's go back again to the second question. How did Christianity gain ground in the global south? Well, there are three important factors that I would like for you to think about. We usually think that the Protestant missionary movement was all about imperialism and colonialism. And there's no doubt about that. Protestant missionary work was incidental with imperialism from many of the Western empires. But not everything, not everything was actually about colonialism or imperialism. And I want to give you three examples just to, just to get juices going in your mind and in your thoughts. First of all, consider the following. Missionaries worked with nationals in order to translate the scriptures to the mother tongue of the national. Can you imagine what happens when people begin to listen and even read the gospel in their own language, in their own tongue? You don't have, in these translations, you don't have just the transliteration of certain terms you actually have the full translation of what some of the main theological themes of Christian scriptures mean in another culture, in another culture, in another language. In other words, suddenly the gospel does not sound so strange. On the contrary, the gospel begins to be heard with with the metaphors, the imagery, even the sound and the rhythm that comes from our heart because it is our mother tongue. By translating the scriptures, nationals actually contributed to making the gospel take ground in the life of the people. So, the second point is 
the agency of the nationals, like I said before, in translating the scriptures was very important, but also it's the agency of the gospel in using the idiomatic expressions of the divine of a particular culture to speak about the Christian gospel. For instance, in some of the indigenous language of Latin America, the, ex the, the terms that are used to describe the love of God, to describe grace, are terms that are connected to the indigenous worldview. And as a result, the gospel begins to be understood in the terms and in the imaginary of the indigenous people. It's not any more strange. It's actually very, very contextual, very current. And finally, the third factor is the biographical character of the Christian religion. You know, Christianity is a religion of testimony. And one of the things that we have discovered in the, in the stories of Christianity's movement from culture to culture is that Christianity has the capacity of, of inserting, the gospel has the capacity of inserting itself in the story of a people. So that the story of the gospel is also part of the story of a people. It's a biography is a testimony. Christianity gains ground in the people's daily life experience. We call that process cross-cultural diffusion of the Christian religion. Christianity was transformed from a religion of the West to a religion of these regions, gaining ground not on Christian systems brought from the West, but rather on the customs, the language, and the daily life experience of people in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Let me conclude with this comment. Have you ever been in a Pentecostal service in Latin America or in sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia? Pentecostalism is, the, is one of the traditions of the Christian faith that is growing leaps and bounds in the global south. And part of the reason why Pentecostalism is growing is because pen the Pentecostal experience is grounded on people's daily life experience. When the experience of the gospel of Jesus Christ is grounded in people's daily life experience with their language, with their metaphors, connecting with their needs and their stories, Christianity gains vitality. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for watching this video. And I invite you to come to Perkins. We do explore these questions in a deeper way, and we try to find ways in which what we discover as historians and theologians and theologians that practice um, in the practices of the church we try to make it relevant for the ministry that you, others, and ourselves are involved in our churches and in the world. Thank you.